Okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about Bible prophecy. Not a moment too soon, maybe. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I have some threats from some YouTube subscribers uh, telling me that I could never, ever, ever leave and not do a prophecy update ever again. Ever. <laughs> you know, as soon as I left, then all H-E double toothpicks, if I can say it that way, breaks out in Egypt again. And uh, I, I, here's what I'm thinking. Every time I leave, something happens. So here's what I'm thinking. Stay with me. I'm going to leave again, a little bit longer, and maybe the rapture will happen. <laughs> okay. Well, I think for what would be deemed obvious reasons, I'd be grossly remiss not to address this prophecy uh, concerning Egypt for today's update. I think over the last couple years, I've tried, I've done my best, I've endeavored to keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening uh, in Egypt. This because of the prophecy about Egypt found in Isaiah chapter 19. You know, it's kind of sad because uh, during the last couple, three weeks, this uh, George Zimmerman trial has really eclipsed uh, that which is even now right before our very eyes taking place uh, there in the Middle East. I, I, I only speak for myself and I don't want to make any comments concerning uh, the trial. Uh, I am uh, though satisfied with the outcome. However, and this is a, there's a big however on the tail end of this, the thing that has been the most troubling for me throughout this whole ordeal has been this country's seemingly insatiable fascination with something that took place and politically rose to the level of eclipsing everything else, chief of which was what's happening right now in the Middle East. It's almost a, I don't want to read too much into it, but it seems like a satanic component. It's almost like, you know, the enemy wants to get our eyes, you know, off the prize, as it were, and focus on things that matter not for eternity. You know, I think the, the, the acid test for all of us as believers is what does this time investment on my part, how, how will it matter for or impact eternity? And I think it's a sort of a qualifying and a prioritizing of our time in these last days because simply put, we have no more time in these last days. Well, that said, if you were to ask me which Bible prophecy I thought was one of the most visible of all of the Bible prophecies that's right now visibly being fulfilled, my answer would have to be uh, Isaiah 19, this prophecy concerning Egypt. And not too far behind it is Isaiah 17, the prophecy concerning Syria, which interestingly has also sort of been eclipsed as well. I think it's important to understand that these prophecies continue, uh, the developments continue to escalate really at breakneck speed. Now, <clears throat> this prophecy about Egypt is one of the many reasons that I believe the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ may in fact be closer than any of us realize, especially as we'll see here shortly as we get to the end of the chapter in Isaiah 19. Uh, we're sort of given a little bit of a hint in terms of the timeline and the progression of this particular uh, prophecy. And really it's for this reason that I think it's incumbent upon me to revisit this astounding Bible prophecy, especially in light of the recent developments 
this uh, overthrowing of Mohammed Mursi, I, I believe, took many by surprise, present company included. So in order to do this, I'm going to have you, if you haven't already, turn to Isaiah 19. We're going to start at the beginning of the chapter. Really, the whole chapter of Isaiah 19 is a prophecy concerning specifically Egypt. Very detailed prophecy concerning Egypt. And what I'm hoping is, is that we'll all see how that this specific prophecy with all of its details may in fact be coming to pass exactly like we were told it would right now in real time before our very eyes. Now, in the interest of time, and because we've already conducted a study through Isaiah 19 in previous updates, today we're only going to do a cursory analysis of this prophecy, but by doing this in this way, I think we can still sort of examine the entire prophecy and in so doing we can uh, have the bigger prophetic picture come clearer into focus especially in light of the progression of this uh, prophecy now what follows are six specific details you might find more but I'm just gonna condense it to six that I found recorded in the chapter, the first four of which I would suggest are already in play now. And then the last two I truly believe are soon to ensue. The stage is already being set. It's just a matter of time, which is why I believe there is a timeline sort of woven into the fabric of this Egypt prophecy in Isaiah 19. Our first prophetic detail is found in verses 1 and 2, where we're told that Egyptians will rise up against Egyptians. Uh, and this is the first time we looked at this prophecy in Isaiah 19. It was back in January of 2011. Uh, I believe that's when this began to come to pass. It was when the so-called Arab Spring commenced in Cairo's Tahrir Square. Now, what's interesting to note is that some believe the uprising gained traction back in 2011 after a soccer match between the two cities of Giza and Port Said. Now, why do I mention that? Because there's this detail that I want to draw your attention to in verse 2. Listen to what it says. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother. Perhaps better said the Muslim Brotherhood. Neighbor against neighbor. And listen to this. City against city. Kingdom against city, a uh, kingdom. Call me silly, but <laughs> does this not appear to be this detail that the Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to record for us all these generations prior? So when in that day, I love those three words, by the way, in that day, I hope you know that in that day is today. Kind of got a little ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> and in that day, God says, this is what I'm going to do. And I would submit to you that we are in that day and God is doing it. This uprising sort of dovetails into our second prophetic detail, which is found in verses 3 and 4. Here, we're told that the Egyptians will come under a cruel rule given over to a fierce king. It seems that this subsequent uprising, it's also called a second revolution, that which we witnessed in recent weeks, uh, was really still part of this 
uh, uprising that began in 2011 because now that this Mohammed Mursi, this Muslim Brotherhood president sought to bring them under a cruel rule, that's what was the catalyst for this recent uprising. And I believe that this is evidence that this part of the prophecy is still in play. And now it would seem that the jury is out. I was listening to a couple of commentators. As you might imagine, I'm uh, all over the place looking for uh, some you know, information uh, on uh, what's really happening in Egypt. And of course, you have to go outside the scope of uh, the you know, domestic media because all you're going to get there is, it's interesting, not to beat up on this trial, but um, it was like you know, there was a 30-second spot on Egypt and then there was a three-hour you know, <laughs> coverage of the trial. I'm just thinking to myself, this, this, is, this is grievous. <laughs> this is grievous. Anyway. I'll, uh, I'll stop talking about it. <laughs> but it, it just kind of triggered it when I said the jury is still out on Muhammad Morsi, and it kind of just, anyway. So, <laughs> so this is still in play. Keep in mind now, this prophecy is not just linear in the sense that the, the prophecy has to be seen as a whole and really encompass the whole of the chapter. And I think we'll see this clearly with our third prophetic detail in verse 5, uh, verses 5 through 10. Uh, to me, it's the most notable. And it's because Egyptians will become impoverished from a parched Nile. For those of you who were with us a, a while back, we did a prophecy update on this dam that Ethiopia is building, one of the largest dams in all of the world. And upon completion, this dam has the propensity to completely dry up an already drying up Nile. And I won't take the time in the interest of time, but if you just read verses 5 through 10 on your own time, you will find, again, these specific details recorded about the Nile River from which Egypt really makes their living. From the fishing, the water, it's crucial. It's really the lifeline for Egypt. And if Ethiopia does this and completes this, they will dry up the Nile, and I believe they will fulfill exactly what was foretold by the prophet of old right here in Isaiah. I, I think that, honestly, again, the details that are included here are all collectively coming to pass in play, being fulfilled in real time, and this is no exception. This brings us to our fourth prophetic detail. It's in verses 11 through 15. Here we're told, again, very interesting detail, that the Egyptians will be led astray by a Pharaoh-controlled deception. Interesting details. You want to read the, the prophecy in these verses, but I, I find this detail rather interesting because Mursi, after being elected, was seen as having, quote, usurped all state powers so as to appoint himself Egypt's new pharaoh. You have to understand, in the book of Exodus, a pharaoh was seen as a god. <laughs> And the cruel rule of Pharaoh, just ask the Israelites in slavery there in Egypt under this fierce Pharaoh, this cruel rule. Now in verses 16 and 17, we see our fifth prophetic detail, which is really a description of how the Egyptians will not only be in fear of Israel, but they'll be in fear of the God of Israel. This is where we sort of turn a corner because yet future, we're told, 
The Egyptians will shudder with fear at God's uplifted hand against them. In other words, they're going to recognize the handprint of God all over that which is happening to the Egyptians there in Egypt, and it will result in their becoming terrified because of Israel and the God of Israel. And that's a good thing, by the way, because that's going to serve as a catalyst for what we see in our sixth prophetic detail, which is when, in the end, the Egyptians will cry out to the Lord, to the God of Israel, and be saved. This is utterly amazing. And it's this last part of the prophecy that brings me, as an Arab, born to an Egyptian father, much hope for the Egyptian people. Please pray for the Egyptian people. God has a plan for the Egyptian people. The Lord is going to make himself known to the Egyptian people in a saving way. And we're told at the end of this prophecy that Egypt will come to a saving knowledge of the God of Israel. Now, stay with me because this is where the hint of a timeline uh, sort of comes into focus. Now, it's very likely that this glorious end of this prophecy will find its ultimate fulfillment during the millennium. And it does speak to the amazing grace of God. Uh, listen for just a moment. I want to read, if you don't mind, this uh, part of the prophecy from verses 18 on through 25. You'll see why here in a minute. In that day, there it is again, <laughs> love that verse 18, five cities in Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of destruction, verse 19. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign, verse 20, and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt when they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors. He will send them a savior and defender and he will rescue them. So the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will sacrifice, wor worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. The Lord will strike Egypt with a plague, verse 22. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord. He will respond to their pleas and heal them. Verse 23, in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Unthinkable. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, verse 24, Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. Listen to verse 25. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. <gasps> what? <laughs> I thought Israel was my people. No. Listen. Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Look at the delineation here. I love what F.B. Meyer of this says. Who, standing amid the terrors of the place, could have ever supposed that Egypt would be addressed as my people? Who could have thought that Assyria, the tyrant persecutor, would ever be called the work of my hands. Yet these, listen, I love this, are the trophies and triumphs of divine grace. The trophies and triumphs of divine grace. It's not about how bad they were, especially the Assyrians. Do you know what the Assyrians did to the Israelites? 
See, it's not about how bad the Assyrians were or even the Egyptians are. It's all about how good God is. And it's all of grace. This is the grace of God. Listen to Charles Spurgeon. He writes in The Fruits of Grace and lists nine characteristics of God's grace as it relates to this Isaiah 19 prophecy about Egypt's salvation in the end. I'm going somewhere with this, so hang on. Number one, God's grace often comes to the very worst of men. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, a little slow to uh, agree. That's okay. See me after. Two, God's grace sends a savior. Number three, God's grace changes men's language. Number four, God's grace sets men on holy service. Number five, God's grace teaches men to pray. Number six, God's grace instructs men. Number seven, grace makes even trouble a blessing to a man. And number eight, God's grace changes the relations of men to each other. That's uh, what we're going to be talking about here in Romans in a moment. And number nine, lastly, God's grace makes men to be blessed and to be a blessing to others. It's at this juncture on God's grace that I'll bring today's prophecy update to a close, and here's why. I want to share with you something that the Lord has really ministered to my heart in a powerful way as it relates to the prophet Jeremiah. This has been over the last couple of weeks, even having some time away on the mainland. I just was sort of uh, stunned by this contrast between this prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Isaiah. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done a study of Jeremiah, but it's probably one of the most depressing uh, <laughs> uh, books you'll ever read. I mean, here's a pro Th Jeremiah would have never been, been asked to speak at any conferences. <laughs> he didn't have one conversion. Not one person responded uh, to his uh, message and came to salvation. They, in fact, re rejected him. And it's brutal. I mean, and he's called the weeping prophet, and for good reason. I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting because even the contrast with Jeremiah and Jonah, which is maybe another topic for another time, but have you ever thought about that? Here's the reluctant prophet and the weeping prophet. Now, let's just kind of contrast them. You think anybody's going to invite Jonah to speak at their conference? Oh, excuse me, but did he not like, you know, because of his message? And the response to his message, and it wasn't even really a message. It wasn't even a, a gospel message. It wasn't, you know, you need to repent to be saved. No, you're toast, man. 40 days, you're going to burn. <laughs> he didn't even offer them any hope. And yet they all got saved. And what's, what's his response after Nineveh gets saved? He's angry at God. How could you save them? You know, here, so you got Jonah, the multitudes of people get saved, and then you got Jeremiah, not even one. Not even one. He couldn't even get somebody to just raise their hand to kind of get the things going. And contrast the two. Well, contrast Jeremiah and Isaiah, and it's really sobering to me, I guess, for lack of a better word how that nobody believed Jeremiah and the prophesying about a coming future judgment. They excoriated him. They ridiculed him. They rejected him. And the reason I bring this up is that it seems to be an apt description of our world today, does it not? How that the world today does not believe 
that judgment is coming. If they did, I believe they would be like the Ninevites and repent. If they really believed that this is what's coming and it is coming. It is coming. Now here's the question. And this is really for anyone who does not know Jesus Christ or is unsure about their saving relationship with Jesus Christ as their Savior. Here's the question. Are you going to accept Bible prophecy, the prophesying of what's coming, like in Isaiah, or are you going to reject Bible prophecy like in Jeremiah? So does that mean then that proportionate to my belief in this coming judgment will be my response to these prophecies? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, just by way of an illustration, I'm sorry in advance for this illustration, but it, it, uh, it's the best one I've got, and if you have a better one, just please let me know afterwards, and I'll be happy to uh, incorporate it. Um, let's just say for purpose of discussion that uh, I stood before you this morning, and I said to you that uh, there's a, a bomb in the kitchen. Now you know why I, I you know, could maybe use a better illustration than an Arab using bomb illustrations, but let's just say, just for purpose of discussion, that there's a bomb in the kitchen, and I, I, that's the message. I said, there's a bomb in the kitchen. And then I just kept on going on doing what I'm doing as if nothing's really going to happen. Would you believe that there's really a bomb in the kitchen? Probably not. What if on the other side of the table I said to you, there's a bomb in the kitchen, and then I proceeded, because I'm such a godly pastor and selfless, making sure that you, you know, uh, get out safely, you know, before saving my own bacon. <laughs> I hope that's what I do. <laughs> but let's just say for purpose of illustration, that's what I do. <laughs> um, would you believe me then? That that's really what's gonna happen? Well, you see where I'm going with this? So too is this true with the prophecies that we have and sadly those on the receiving end of Jeremiah's prophecy rejected it, rejected him, rejected God. They didn't believe why everything keeps going on as it has. And conversely, we have before us a prophecy that is very explicit and specific in its details here in Isaiah 19. What's your response to it? Do you think it's going to happen? Well, I would submit to you, it's already happening. It's already happening. Exactly like Isaiah said it would. And by the way, there's a shelf life here, is there not? Think about this. We saw the first few verses already begin to come to pass. And then the Nile River part of the prophecy begin to come to pass. The cruel rule begin to come to pass. And if we see the end of the prophecy ultimately find its fulfillment in the millennium, and before the millennium has to be the, the seven-year tribulation, and before the seven-year tribulation has to be the rapture, how close are we? How close are what more do you need to see in order to believe it will happen? And Jesus said it will come at a time that we expect not. Would you pray with me? Oh, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this prophecy here in your word. Lord, we can only now ask you that the Holy Spirit would be given his rightful place to begin the process of ministering this to our hearts. For those of us who know you and are walking with you and are ready for you, that Lord, this would just 
light that fire in our hearts and create that urgency in our lives. But Lord, for those who don't know you, that this would be that which they would see as the prophecy beginning to come to pass that they would realize you've told us what would happen long before it would happen so that when it would begin to happen we would believe. Lord thank you in Jesus name Amen.